from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to talk on fools. And I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 18th verse. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. A couple years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What kind of a fool am I? to the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, Fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, Fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, The American people want to be fooled, and I'm here to fool them. He said, A fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. <laughs> a one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. And God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and they're wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53, 1 and Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the this fool deliberately says, there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws, and we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. 
So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now, you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins they mock God's standards, God's standards of sex, God's standards of marriage, God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell, but your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines, far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. Find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else, your wife, your family, your church, your friends, but the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last, after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and he that uttereth a slander is a fool passing along an evil story about others, maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination, worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife, or a club. He that others a slander, the Scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember he was appearing to the disciples, in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned and they were mumbling and groaning among themselves, and another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them, said, Why are you so downcast? They said, Oh, we thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus? who did wonderful things. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross, and now the third day is passing. We heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, Oh, fools, you're fools. 
Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the Word of God in his hand, who reads his testimony and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the Scriptures that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now? probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thy knees, drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack. And when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, thou fool, this night thy soul is required of thee. And the Scripture says, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place, money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die and they die shortly after they retire? It's amazing. I've thought about that. Some people announce their retirement, you read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life but it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or I'm an eminent man. I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool that laid up treasures on earth but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave. 
counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, But unto us which were saved it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here, Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs in that hollow stare that they have. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We're fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The Scripture says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool, that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell, as it were. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom of God. And we're straddling the fence. God does not allow fence straddlers. You cannot be a mugwomp. That's what a mugwomp is, a fence straddler. God, Christ does not allow that. He allows no neutrality. You can't not be both. You must come all out. For him, and you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day, and he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross, and it said, Many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor. Make that call. And if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, 
It says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the Son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me, he cannot see my sins. And God has a unique ability that you don't have. God can forget. And it says that he forgets your sins. In other words, the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die. Because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on. You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ, and you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision-making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, uh, the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen and counselors are standing by ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. 
Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for Billy Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings, the 18th chapter. 1 Kings, the 18th chapter in the Old Testament. 1 Kings 18. And this is one of the most dramatic stories in all the Bible. 1821. How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal be God, follow him. And the people answered, not a word. Elijah is the most remarkable character to me in all the Old Testament. I like to read about him. He's mentioned 30 times in the New Testament and when Jesus Christ went to the Mount of Transfiguration, there were two men that were there with him, Elijah and Moses. So we know that hundreds of years after Elijah had died or had been taken to heaven, we know that he came back and we know that he was living and he was talking because he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here in his life story, he suddenly appears at the darkest moment of Israel's history. Never had the nation gone so low morally, spiritually, militarily, economically, as it was at this hour. The nation was struggling for its very existence, and out of nowhere, there came this rugged, strong, craggy, young, long-haired, sun-tanned son of the desert. Elijah, and he suddenly announced to the people, Elijah is here. And the king trembled on his throne because Elijah came in the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. It used to be said that Mary, Queen of Scots, was more afraid of the prayers of John Knox, one preacher, than she was all the armies of England. One man, and God constitute a majority anywhere. Elijah was a mighty prophet of the Lord. And what had happened in Israel that had caused Israel to go down so rapidly was that a very wicked man had come to the throne. His name was Ahab. And the Bible says that he did more evil than any other king that had ever preceded him. And then he did something else. He married a woman from one of the heathen nations, which was against ancient Israeli law. He married Jezebel, and she worshipped 
Baal. She didn't believe in God. She didn't believe in the God of ancient Israel. She didn't believe in the God of Moses. She didn't believe in the God of Abraham. She believed in Baal. And Baal was one of the worst forms of worship that we've ever known. Filled with sensuality, sex orgies, human sacrifice, and all the rest. And this is a very interesting thing, that in a time when people turn away from the true God, many times you'll find that they will put sex, violence, and their religion together. And we're seeing indications of that in America with the rise of Satan worship and their cults, the emphasis on sex, the emphasis on violence. Put them together and you have something the Bible says that God abhors and God will judge and the wrath of God will fall upon that people. And that was the situation when Elijah appeared on the scene. And the first thing Elijah did was to protest. Except Elijah was almost alone. He thought he was alone. But God had told him later that there were 7,000 that hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. And Elijah said to the king, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather all the prophets of Baal that believe in idolatry and lead idolatry in this country. I want you to gather them at Mount Carmel that looks out over the Mediterranean Sea. And I'll come up there and we'll let all the people come and watch and we'll have a contest. I will debate the 450 prophets of Baal publicly and let the people decide who is God. And the king said, all right. So all the people gathered, thousands of people gathered on Mount Carmel and the 400 prophets of Baal. And Elijah was standing for God alone. He was just one man, one solitary prophet standing there all by himself. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get two bulls, build two altars. You call on your God, Baal. I'll call on my God, the true and the living God, and we'll see who answers by fire. They said, all right. So they built their altar. They cut their bull, bullock up, laid it on the altar, thousands of people watching, and then they began to call on Baal. They said, oh, Baal, 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 answer by fire. We know you're the true God. Nothing happened. And Elijah stood there and laughed at it. And it's one of the most humorous things in all the Bible. He said, go ahead, yell. Maybe your God's on a trip somewhere. <laughs> and from morning till noon, they screamed and they yelled and they cried and they prayed and then they began to cut themselves until blood was gushing out all over the place, trying to get Baal to answer. But of course, Baal couldn't answer. Then Elijah said, all right, it's time for me to take over. He said, all right, build the altar. And they built the altar, put the bullock on the altar. He said, now I want you to get 12 barrels of water and pour it on top. Dig a trench around it, fill that with water, and everything is soaking wet. Then Elijah called upon God. And the fire came down from heaven and burned up the bullock and burned up the altar, burned up the whole thing. And the people said, we believe in the Lord God who is answered by fire. And Elijah won the day and left Mount Carmel victorious over the false prophets of Baal. I want you to notice who was there. Three groups of people. One group one man, Elijah. So on the other side, 450 prophets of Baal, all experts in religion, philosophy, and psychology. And on the 
And out in between were the vast mass of people who were not sure. They were uncommitted. They were not sure whether Baal was God. They were not sure whether Elijah's God was God. Their ancient, ancient traditions made them want to believe in Jehovah. Their interest, though, was in pleasing the king and being relevant and being in. They didn't want to be old-fashioned and traditionalist and out of step. They didn't want to be caught believing in the Ten Commandments if that wasn't the end thing. You see, men have always been sort of faddist. We go after fads. That's true in every generation. And the end thing at that moment was to believe in Baal with all the freedom of sex and sensuality and the orgies. Now, they didn't like the human sacrifice, but all religion demands some sort of sacrifice, so what they would do, they'd take their babies, many times a chosen baby, and put in the hands of this great God, and the baby would be burned up, and they'd give their babies as human sacrifices. That was Baal worship. But then there were many who were secret followers of the true God. They didn't believe all that hocus-pocus about Baal. They had a guilty feeling about it, but they were afraid. They were afraid of standing up for God, afraid of standing up for what they believed to be truth. And so they didn't take a stand publicly. You see, Jesus demands a public stand. That's why I ask people to come forward. He demands a public stand. You can't be a secret follower of Jesus and please him. He said, if you're not willing to take your stand publicly and openly, I'll not take my stand openly for you in heaven. And without the intercession of Jesus Christ, none of us would ever make it. And then Elijah said something to all these people. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal then follow him. He said, make a decision. God's not going to allow you to have an altar to Baal in your home, to materialism in your home, and then go to church on Sunday and think that's going to do it. You've got to come all out for Jesus Christ. He must be first and Lord in every area of your life if you're to be acceptable to God. Now, the people had seen the evidence. They knew Baal couldn't give them peace and joy and happiness. They knew that. You know, one of our most famous film stars said the other day this. I won't call her name, but she was quoted in one of the magazines as saying this. I was the victim of the American dream. I'd been brought up to believe that when I found success, I would automatically be terribly happy. We were all taught that. Well, I got the success I'd spent 21 years believing that as soon as all these wonderful things happened to me, my troubles would vanish. Well, they didn't. It, it was a big disillusionment, she said. And she's only 21 now. 21 years! Thinking that if she made it on television, and she's famous on television, and she's famous in motion pictures around the world, that she'd be happy. She said, it's been a big disillusion. You see, Baal can't bring inner peace and satisfaction to the human heart. Pascal once said it, the great scientist. He said, happiness is neither within or without us. It is in God. And only when God is in us is happiness within us and without us. How true that is. Happiness and peace and joy come in knowing God. Baal couldn't answer their deepest needs, their great philosophical questions of where did I come from, why am I here, where am I going. Baal gave them no answers. Neither does capitalism and materialism and secularism and humanism. It's found only in a relationship with God. You see, you were made for God made in God's image, made for fellowship with God. And you can try all your life in a thousand different directions to find that certain something and you'll never find it. 
I've seen men strive to become the most brilliant scientists, and I know some of the most brilliant scientists in America, that are miserable. I've seen men spend their lifetime making money, and I know some of the richest men in America, and I know how miserable some of them are. I've seen men strive all their lives to attain political power. And they get political power. They get the office they were seeking, but it doesn't bring the peace and the joy and the happiness and the fulfillment they thought it would. But here's an interesting thing. I've never seen a person give their lives to Jesus Christ sincerely, but what they didn't find, what they were looking for. He satisfies the deepest longings of our hearts and our lives. Now, Elijah taught us one thing, and Jesus teaches it too. You must make a choice. You have a will of your own, and you have to decide. How long will you halt between two opinions? Jesus said there are two ways of life. Now, the Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Some of you think you're all right and that you're on the right road now. You don't realize that you're on the broad road that leads to destruction. Jesus said there are two roads, the broad road and the narrow road. The narrow road leads to eternal life. The broad road leads to destruction. And every person in this audience tonight is on one or the other. Which are you on? He said there are two masters. He said you cannot serve God and mammon. You'll either hate one and love the other or love one and hate the other. He said make a choice. He said there are two fathers. You know, the Bible doesn't teach the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, not in the sense that many people teach it. By creation, he's our father. By creation, we're all members of the same human race, and that's why we're to love each other no matter what race we come from. We're all brothers in that sense. But spiritually speaking, spiritually speaking, we are not all of the same father and all of the same blood. There are only two groups, those who are lost and those who are saved, those on the broad road, those on the narrow road. You must be on one or the other. And there are two destinies. There is a heaven and there is a hell. I know it's not popular today to believe in hell. You can believe in heaven, but people would rather not think about hell. I don't blame you. It's a terrible place. But the Bible teaches it's going to be a hell. There is a hell where men are going to be separated from God forever. And there's a heaven where men are going to fellowship with each other and fellowship with Christ forever. You must make a choice. You young people, you have to make the choice. This is one choice you can't depend on your parents to make for you. Your parents can teach you and help you and do their best. And many of you parents have done your best with your children. You've prayed for them. You've loved them. But there comes a time when they have to make their own choice about Jesus Christ. They have to decide for themselves in the lonely arena of their own hearts. The greatest battle that's ever fought is this battle in the heart of a young person about Jesus Christ. And this is one thing you can't depend on anybody to make for you. You have the ability to make it. You have the right to make it. You can say yes or you can say no. It's one or the other. And Jesus does not allow neutral ground. And he warns against waiting too long. The Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. Come while you can. Don't put it off any longer. How long halt you between two opinions? Now, when you make that choice, there's going to be a price to be paid. The people that choose Jesus Christ will pay a price. There are thousands of people in other parts of the world, the price they have to pay is they're ostracized from their family. In some parts of the world, they can never go any further than grammar school if they make a decision for Christ. They can never get a job above menial labor 
if they make a decision for Christ. But in those parts of the world, thousands upon thousands are living for Jesus Christ. In America, we've had sort of an unnatural situation. It's almost popular to follow Christ in some areas of the country now. That won't last long. There's always a price. And if you receive Christ as your Savior and try to live for him, some people are going to sneer and they're going to make fun behind your back. And in this period of conformity, we don't want to be considered too different. But he calls upon you to be different. When the gang is doing certain things you know to be wrong, you take your stand and say, no, I can't do that because I'm a Christian because I believe in Jesus Christ. It costs something to follow Christ. And Jesus said, you better sit down and count the cost one day. You see, a big crowd was following Jesus, and he said, wait a minute, count the cost. Do you know that I'm going to die on a cross, and if you follow me, you're going to have to go die with me? Oh, we didn't know that, Jesus. We thought you were setting up a big kingdom. We were going to be in the kingdom with you. So they left him. They will, there will be the cross for you to bear before the crown. And when you do come to Jesus Christ, you're going to be tested by God. God never has anyone come to him that he doesn't test you. Some of you have made your decisions for Christ this week and already you're being tested. Temptation is coming. A friend doesn't understand the step that you've taken. Already you are filled with some doubts. And weakness this is all normal to every person that ever came to Christ we don't start just jump right out and be full-grown Grady Wilson just his daughter just had twins well they weren't born full-grown one of them was five pounds and one was six pounds and they're just little tiny babies but they will be full-grown someday but it takes time to grow. God will test you when you come to Christ. And he demands an immediate decision. I wonder how many more sermons it would take to win you to Christ. How many more warnings will God have to give you? How, how many more graves will have to be dug? How many more wars will have to be fought? How many more earthquakes or tornadoes and floods will have to come before you make your decision? The thief on the cross took that one moment and said, Lord, remember me. And in that moment, Jesus said, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. That quick, you can make your decision and commitment. And remember, God loves you. He has a plan for your life. You're sinful. You're separated from God by sin. And some of the results of this sin are worry and irritability and lack of purpose in life, as well as some of the gross, immoral sins that we read about. God has provided the cross as a means for you to be forgiven of sin, but you must individually receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart will have to make that decision. How long? will you halt between two opinions. Charlotte Elliott was a beautiful woman and a great preacher by the name of Caesar Milan went all over Switzerland. He was put out of his church because of his faith. But once he was in England and he met this beautiful, charming young woman by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She was suffering ill health and he went up to her and asked her if she would become a Christian. And she rebuked him and said, I resent you asking me that. And she was very irritated at him. He said, I didn't mean to be offensive to you, but I only meant to tell you that God loves you and God's willing to change your life and give you peace in your heart. That night, Charlotte Elliott could not sleep. The words that the preacher spoke to her kept ringing in her ears. And during the night, she got up, got on her knees, gave her life to Christ, and she sat down and wrote the hymn that we sing every night. Just as I am, without one plea, 
but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as you are. You don't have to go home and change clothes. You don't have to go home and get better. You can't improve yourself. You come just like you are with all your sins, with all your failures, with all your mistakes, with all your hypocrisy. You come just as you are. He will forgive you and change you and come into your life. And I'm going to ask you to do just that publicly and openly right now. I'm going to ask hundreds of you to get up out of your seat from all over the stadium and come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I do receive Christ. You may be a member of the church. You might have thought that you were right with God before, but somehow you know you're not. You're not sure. You're not certain, but you'd like to be. I'm going to ask you to come right now. From up in the top galleries, it'll take a minute or two to come, but we're going to wait. Hundreds of people have come every night. You come. This is your moment and your hour of commitment. And after you've all come and stand here quietly, I'm going to say a word to you, have a prayer with you, give you some literature, and you can go back and join your friends. And if you're with friends or relatives or you've come in a bus, they'll wait on you. But you get up and come right now and make your commitment to Christ. We're going to wait. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. you that are watching by television, you can make your commitment right now in your home or wherever you happen to be watching. Hundreds of people here at the University of Kentucky Coliseum are coming to Jesus Christ. They're choosing between these two opinions. They're choosing Christ. They're coming just as they are. You can come just as you are where you are. May God help you to make that commitment tonight. God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the...